following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Christianity is based on the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And uh, if you want to know the meaning of what is written, whether in the Old or New Testament, you have to know Kabbalah, which when we said Kabbalah, we, we, we talk about the Tree of Life or the Ten Sephiroth which uh, relate to the structure of the universe and the human being. So, let me draw it for you in a simple way so you can, uh, most, of, uh, most of you know, right, because most of the lectures that we have in the website are always related with this symbol. Okay, these are which are called the Ten Sephiroth, which are uh, mainly three triangles and one sephira, which sephira is singular for sephiroth, it's plural. So the one in the bottom is what we call the kingdom. I will tell you the, the names in English, so it will be easier. This is a crown, okay, which is on the top. That's why it's called crown. The one in the left, this is the number one. The number two is called wisdom. The number three is called uh, intelligence. It's also called uh, understanding. But when you understand uh, something, it's because you are intelligent. The number four is here. Uh, it's called love or mercy. Sometimes uh, the translation of uh, in Hebrew is gedula. Instead of love, they said is greatness, because uh, gadol means great and gedula means greatness, and of course, greatness is also love. The number five is justice. The number seven, I mean six. Splendor, and it's also called beauty, or sometimes glory, because uh, in reality in Hebrew uh, there are many ways to say the same word, because it relates to the different aspects of the human being. Seven is victory. And here is when we have glory, the number eight, Glo glory, one L. 
So that's why sometimes when you find the word hod, means splendor or glory. There are many ways to say uh, uh, the same, uh, these this words, but uh, it's, uh, I will explain you why it's, uh, it's in that way. Number nine is called foundation. And the number 10, kingdom. Those are the famous 10 sephiroth in English. And in Hebrew, it's called Keter, Chochma, Bina, Chesed, or Gedula, Gebura, Tifereth, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, in Malkut. This is the ten Sephiroth. And the. Uh, hmm? A different color? To make it nice? Hmm? No, I can write. So. Uh, I will write in my own way here. You see, sometimes when you read this uh, sephira in English, I mean, in, in yeah, when you read it with English, sometimes it's a chokma, but there is no such ch in Hebrew. Only ch, ch, ch. And the ch sounds ch, 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 ma, right? more or less. And this is bina, right? Kete chokma bina, and then. Chesed. And sometimes they said Chesed, and it's not Chesed, it's Chesed. What? Oh, yeah, this is. Uh, justice is called Gebura. Yeah, it's actually good that I'm writing this, because and then my brain receives an information now about this. It is written there. Tiferet. Tifereth, Netzach, you see, this is how Netzach, uh, C-H, Hod, In here the, the letter H by itself sounds very soft, Hod, but this is <laughs> and here Yesod, And Malkut. That's why sometimes in the Bible you find this word Malkut. Sometimes Malka means the queen. Malkut is kingdom. Melek is king. See? Melek, Malka, Malkut. Right? Always it's, it's the same, different ways to pronounce this. So, in the way that we study this uh, 10 Sephiroth easily, <coughs> for us to understand the relationship with, relationship with alchemy. You know, alchemy is a science of uh, transformation of energies. Everything that we are talking in, in, in uh, meditation and with the runes is really alchemy. Taking energy, transforming into the body, or eating is transformation of uh, the body through the metabolism in order to have different type of energies. That's alchemy. Actually, alchemy is uh, a, a word that derives from Allah or El, which is also God in Hebrew. Allah is God in, in Arabic. So, chemistry. This is Al chemistry the chemistry or the way in which God transforms its own self in different living entities. The cow, for instance, there, all those cows that are there, eating the grass, they transform that through alchemy into milk and then to cheese. And the reality is that uh, 
that's alchemy. Why? Because the one that is doing it is God. I was talking with what, with whom I was talking. I said that it's too sad that we have a stomach, and the stomach digests all the what we eat and transform that into energy, and we don't know how, and we are not aware of it. Only we eat something that is not good for the body, and we have a stomach ache, and then it's oh. I have a stomach. I am remembering now that I have a stomach because it's aching, right? But most of the time, we don't, we don't have a clue. But who is the intelligence that is doing all of that work? It's Bina. You see? Because the first triangle, when we take the first triangle and put it into, in our body, and then we say, Keter. Heart, hokma, sex, bina. And this is how we always see it in the body, right? The three brains. Remember that we are three centered brain beings. So when we talk about the three brains, we said intellectual brain, emotional brain, and sexual motor instinctual brain. The three centers there. And the instinctual center is precisely the center that we're talking about, that is controlled by Bina. Digest your food, make your circulatory system to work, and all of those uh, uh, intelligent uh, systems that we have in our organism that work, in that sometimes uh, uh, the people that are called doctors study it, but they don't have a clue as well. They just are guessing and trying to control the systems with drugs. And the uh, true doctor knows how to deal with those systems and know that those systems are related with the internal bodies, especially with the vital body that is the one that we work the most here with practices in order to charge the physical body. And this is precisely how we see it, yes, in a simple way. And uh, when we take the second triangle, and then we said mercy or love here in the head, justice, Geburah in the heart, and splenity for earth in the sex. This is how you see it. In a simple way, it's more complicated, but just to see it. Because this is how you understand, for instance, the sixth commandment that says, you shall not fornicate, and falls here. But it's sex related with heart. You see? Because uh, if you take the other triangle, which is uh, victory, glory, and foundation also, and then you find netzach on the head. Actually, the word mexach means forehead. Is it in Hebrew? So it could. Yeah, of course, it's with M and it's size with N, but related to the same area of the head. Then glory, Hod, to this area of the heart. You see? That's why you find there that Hod is means splendor, and, and Tifereth is also splendor. And related to that, when you deal with the three brains. And foundation, sex. It goes there uh, exactly. And of course, the last one that is always uh, independent here in the very bottom is the physicality, the physical body itself. But this could be the physical body, could be the planet, or many other things that uh, we study. And that's why once you understand the structure of the tree of life, you can uh, use your intuition in order to, to understand it. Because if you just got with the intellect, sometimes you don't. Plus the study, as you know, uh, in the website we have the lectures of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Right? Do you know how to uh, read symbols? Exactly. 
But do any of you don't, do not know how to read symbols? Symbols. Huh? Yeah, but it says Hebrew, Hebrew letter you're talking about. I mean, generally, symbols, symbols. Symbolic things in order to know, right? And all of you know, but you don't know. You see? Because the letters of the Roman alphabet are symbols. And you read books. You have a reading all the books. And if you were in the website, you were reading the symbols of the Roman alphabet. So that's the point. You said, you know, you know how to read symbols, archetypes? And the people said, no. Yeah, you know, but you don't know. Right? The thing is that when we enter into this type of knowledge, symbols are more complicated. But when you, if you learn the, in the way that you read English or other language, for instance, uh, uh, people that come from the type, uh, that, that area of uh, Russia, where they use uh, another alphabet, the Greek alphabet, right? The letter P, for instance, like what is the P for us? This is R for, right? It's R. And if you don't know, you think that you are seeing the letter P. And must, plus other letters that you find in the, in the, how you call it, Greek alphabet, right? Right? Yeah. So you find these uh, other symbols. When, when, when I go and, and see the writings in, in Russian, these other letters, I really don't have any idea of, right? But for them, it's very normal because they learn it from childhood. So the same thing is this. When you take your effort to study it, then you will see that it's uh, uh, not complicated. But in the beginning, of course, when you don't know, it's obvious that it's, right? it's uh, learning a new language. But this is a language that you study in the internal planes. When the, your inner being wants to show you something, he write. Like when the, uh, uh, somebody wants to write you in the in the internet and, the, and send you a text message, right in your own language, you understand it. And God does the same thing, but in the astral plane, with archetypes, with symbols. But if you don't know anything about that, you will say, why? Oh, God, please talk to me in English. Right? He says, no, no, no. My language is so complicated, and that alphabet is not good for me. That's what we say. The type of knowledge, you, you mean, you're talking about God, something that is everywhere. Obviously, we use our other archetypes. And this is precisely what the great avatars and messengers gave in the Bible. We're talking about just the Hebrew Bible. The way in the, which it's written is for, for people that understand the true life. Right? For instance, Moses, who is the, the first one that wrote the first five books of the Bible, uh, which is called the Torah, those five books are only the body of the doctrine. But that body of the doctrine is written based on this, which is the spirit, the spirit of the doctrine. And between the spirit and the doctrine is the tradition, which is called Talmud among the Jews. And in that tradition, there are stories and many other tales that hide something. And if you don't know, then you don't know what you're reading. Uh, people in this day and age have uh, the Bible. You know, the Bible was translated in many other lang many languages. But in each translation, they are losing many things because they don't know the original, the, which is the Hebrew. Or if they know the Hebrew, they write what they assume is saying there. But when you see the writing in the Bible in Hebrew, some words mean something else that you know when you know alchemy. A simple, for instance, simple uh, symbol there that you find in any religion is the baptism. All of you were baptized in your religion, whatever it is, 
uh, that's a symbol that was introduced in Christianity, but is everywhere. For instance, uh, uh, when I was visiting Israel, I know, of course, the symbol of baptism. And I expected that the Kabbalists that they're there, they knew about the symbol of what they call it the mikveh, which is the fountain when they go and have that type of baptism, but they do it every Saturday to clean themselves. In talking with them, I realized that they didn't know the meaning of it. Like the Christians. They uh, receive the baptism or any type of ablution and they ignore that there is a relation with the sexual energy. And how do I know that? Why well, I'm sure that? Because all of them have a lot of children. <laughs> and I went there in the internal planes. My being took me there. It showed me that all of them were in darkness. And I was really amazed at how it's possible that these people knowing, knowing the Kabbalah, but they don't know the other things, you know. And it is because we can study only this also by tradition, like a lot of people now uh, know a lot of Kabbalah, but they are not practical Kabbalists, alchemists, in order to experience each one of these ten sephirot. Because uh, we can talk about this, but if you don't experience each one of them, it's just a theory. There is a way, which precisely we are teaching here, which is meditation, in order to experience Keter. Because each one of us has his own Keter. This is what in Christianity is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the, the whole tree of life is in relation with the whole body, as we were explaining. But also it's here, Pina Glan Keter. The right brain, uh, chokhmah. The left, bina. Because you always see it on your back, not in your front, on your back. And then he said, could be the right arm, could be the lung. And the left lung or the left arm. And then here the heart, tiferet, which is the center but could be also your soul. Right uh, leg or, or right kidney. Left left leg or left kidney. Sex, your sexual organs, and your feet at the very bottom. You see that? This is how you see the whole tree of life. So when you are reading any scripture based on this, you have to know all of this in order to know what is this prophet saying or talking about. Because as we said, we have in each, inside of each one of us, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three atoms. We have the monad, which is spirit, divine soul, and human soul. We have a mind, we have an emotional body, we have a vital body, and we have a physical body. So this is how you structure everything. And that's why we advise you always to study the tree of life very slow, patiently, in all the parts. Because in that way, you will understand the book of the Master Samaelon Veor very easily. In every single book, sometimes he doesn't mention this, but he's talking about that. And when you read it, you just, by intuition, say, oh, he's talking about this Sephirah. Right? Sometimes they, they say, he said in, in the books that he wrote, for instance, that are out in Kabbalah, he specify, uh, he talks about the Sephirah. Uh, Alchemy and Kabbalah, in the last book that was delivered to humanity before his death, Pisti Sophia. Do you have the Pisti Sophia, all of you? The Gnostic Bible? 
because it's based on this, from the beginning until the end. He was, of course, uh, the piece of Sophia was uh, written by his disciples, and he was dictating that. And when you read the pieces of Sophia without the unveiling of the Master Samael, if you know Kabbalah, you more or less know what is Jesus talking about. But when you read the explanation that the Master is given, and then you see it's a lot, because the Master only gives a little bit of what is written there based on the tree of life. And this is precisely the point that uh, most of our books are based on Kabbalah. Not kidding. And if you are a practical student, then it gets easy to you to understand, to comprehend the doctrine. There are many Gnostics that uh, they say this is too complicated. And they don't, they push it. And when I go and sometimes uh, read what they wrote about uh, something else, and I say, this is wrong. But they don't know. Because they are not studying this. But when you study this, you, then you find, because uh, the Bible is written based on this. A simple word, for instance. All of us, as you read in the book of the Master, left. The abstract, absolute space in order to appear in the universe as monads. In Kabbalah, that is called exile. Many types of exile. You know? They say we are in exile. And many uh, Kabbalists, they state that the souls here in this physical world are in exile. <coughs> That's understandable. But if I write a book and explain that this exile is the exodus, because the word also is similar, right? Exodus, we are exiting the absolute. That's wrong. The exodus is really the returning into that place. Because Exodus happens here. We see we descend from the top to the matter. And it is here where we are right now. We are here in the very bottom. Below this, number 10, is good that I'm writing in red, is an 11. But that's called Clipot, Hell, Averno, Inferno which is exactly the opposite of all of that. Here is precisely what most of us, we are right now, unfortunately. And we're trying to invert the whole of the force that we have, little by little, in order to enter into the tree of life. Because this is the tree of death, the shadow of all of this. So when as we are now here studying this, is because we want to be in the Exodus. You see? We are slaves in this physical world, as the Bible explains. But Moses, that symbolizes willpower, will take us out of that Egypt into the promised land. And that's the Exodus. When you read it, it says what is written there, explained very nicely. But if you don't know Kabbalah, you think, oh, certain thousands of years ago, these uh, Jewish race were there in the land of the Pharaohs, and Moses arrived and took them all to the promised land, which is precisely there in the Middle East. This is what everybody understands. Wrong. It's completely Kabbalist symbol, similar to the symbol of Noah and his ark, precisely going out. You see, now we are in these times, a lot of organizations are talking about the times of the end, 
right? I think we are really. Earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes. What else are we missing? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, you know. And little by little, we are wiped out. So what we have to do, we need an exodus. But right now, if we think that the exodus is from one land to the other land. Okay, the exodus from England. And you go to Russia and there's earthquakes there. Oh no, the exodus is to Japan. And you go to Japan and there's atomic explosions and a great... <laughs> <laughs> anywhere that you go is, is something meaning out of this physical world right and this is how we're learning because in the end it's not our physicality that wants to be that one we want to save right why do we have to save our physicality sooner or later we are going to be old with gray hair to the grave so what we want to save is the soul. Because our soul is really in this jail that we call physical body. We are suffering here. We make each other a hell of this planet. And in order to go out, we have to work psychologically. And let us not fall into that mistake that people think. If I belong to this group, Gnostic group, I'm going directly into the Exodus. The Exodus is something inside. It doesn't matter where you are, in which group you are. If you are not working psychologically in yourself, it doesn't matter. Even you can be uh, the best friend of Jesus, of Nazareth. It doesn't matter. Personally, I, I, I met the Master Samael in Mexico. But if I don't work in myself, that's really irrelevant, worthless. So I understand that I have to work in myself in the same way that he did it. I remember one time that we were reunited with him in the, in the temple. And one of the students there, one of the missionaries asked him, uh, master, please, can you help me to comprehend my ego? And then the master said, this is precisely the only thing that I cannot do for you. You have to comprehend your ego. Because if I comprehend your ego, I will build mastery because of your ego. And you will remain ignorant. But if you build mastery on the comprehension of your own ego, obviously you will become a master. And this is precisely the point. Many students think that we will comprehend their egos for them. And even if we would do it like the psychiatrists, psychiatrists, right, or psychologists, that you go to a therapy and they you start you still singing there your life and they are trying to help you to comprehend that for you but at the end they don't really care about your your soul it's just the, their way of living right if we want to to be out in the exodus we had to liberate the soul that soul in conjunction all the parts, because we have anger, we have lust, greed, envy, pride, gluttony, laziness, etc. Each of these defects are multitude of aggregates, and each one of them has a part of our soul. So if we annihilate those, we are then collecting the different parts of our soul from every single ego that we comprehend and annihilate. And that is to collect the people of Israel. That is what Israel is. All of the parts of our soul, of all the parts of our being. 
And this is how Israel has to go in the Exodus. Because you remember that it's written that those uh, people that were worshipping or serving the Pharaoh were trying to go. But the sea swallowed them. Because the people are the symbol of ego that we have. And that's why when you listen to this knowledge and you listen with your ego, and you imagine that one day if you keep doing the work, you will be someday in the promised land or in heaven with your ego. With that ego that you come here. No. Sorry. You have to die. Or we have to die, in other words, in order to go into the Exodus. That's the whole thing. If you take the work to read the, the Exodus, you will see that uh, they en uh, endure 40 years in the wilderness. And finally, after 40 years, they go into the promised land. That's Kabbalah. A symbol of uh, the work that we had to perform in order to, to go into the Exodus. But remember that Moses wrote five books. The first book is called Genesis. And that's a Greek word, of course, generation. Genesis comes from genica, which is uh, uh, the word for woman in, in Greek. Because really the woman is uh, the one that generates and that throws us here in this physical world, right? All of us came out from the womb of a woman. And that's Genesis. So we were generated in the womb of our mother. So that's something that all of us know. But then came Jesus and said, well, you need to be born again. Right? And then people think, oh, like in this age, if I believe in Jesus, I am twice born. And this is what everybody thinks. But the Master Samael explains that in his books, that to be born again is a matter of knowing how to utilize the sexual energy. That's what is the first book here in, 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 in the kingdom. The queen has to give birth inside of us because the planet is the kingdom, Malkut, the queen, Mother Nature. But this physicality is part of Mother Nature, right? So we have to be born from this nature too. And that's why we, all the practices that we perform is dealing with energy and with a sexual energy in order to be born again. Because nobody is being born only by believing in something. If we were born here physically in the, through the sexual act also, internally, but we have to know alchemy. And Moses gives the clues, everything, in the book of Genesis from the beginning. Well, you find all of the lectures that we gave already about Genesis. And we keep doing and remembering again and again and again. And it's because there is when Moses left the doctrine in order to be born again. So to be born again means... To be born inside, but utilizing the physicality. Because in order to be born again, we need a physical body. And how uh, does Christianity call the physical body? Or how was called in the beginning of Christianity? That physicality that gives birth again. You are Christians, right? Well, you should know. M Mary? Mary. It begins with M. But in Hebrew is Miriam. 
And I like it better. Miriam. You see? And I don't know why English is Mary, but in different languages, I guess, it's a different way to pronounce that uh, name, right? So when you pronounce Mary, it's actually directly talking to your own nature. Of course, Mary symbolizes the Divine Mother, but the physicality is part of that nature. It's our own physicality. But in the way that we are right now, because when we go to the very bottom of the tree of life, which is feminine, we always say our physicality is the feminine aspect of the tree of life, whether we are male or female. Yeah. Well, it, it of course, it symbolizes something else above. But uh, since we are in the very bottom, we are saying that that Mary symbolizes our own physicality. Hmm? It's a symbol of our own physicality because uh, if we go up here, of course, it's Bina. But this left side of the tree of life is the only side that goes to the bottom. The right side only goes to Yesod. Only the left is the one that goes down. And this is something very important to know. That's why when we talk about Mary, it's here, yes, and also here. And in a simple way that we always talk in, in our lectures, uh, uh, the sacred name of God. All of you know the sacred name of God? Kabbalistically speaking? It's a yod hey bav hey. The four, it's called the tetragrammaton, right? So if you listen, it's yod hey bav hey. The letter hey is repeated twice. Hmm? And it's precisely for that. Yod hey bav hey. So when you said hey, it's a feminine letter that symbolizes the Divine Mother. But if you said the second hey, oh, this is the physical body, our physicality. Is that part that is in exile that the Kabbalists call the Shekinah, the Divine Mother. And of course, you know, you, know, you read the books already that we need to awake the Kundalini, right? This is the way that uh, in Sanskrit is named that feminine force, Kundalini. But in Christianity, is Mary. But I said I prefer the Hebrew word Miriam because it has two M's. And the letter Mem is water. And has very nicely there the meaning of that feminine aspect of God that is very hidden in the Bible. Well, it's talked about, but most of us do not know. For instance, Magdal means tower. And from that in Hebrew comes the word Magdalene, a, a tower, a tower. In Hebrew you said Miriam Magdalene. Of course, you know, that, uh, because there is a, a book that was written there, the, it's called the Da Vinci Code, when they explain about uh, uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus as husband and wife which is true. That's a symbol of them as masters given to this humanity. But if we study our own particular body, obviously the tower that is called Magdal in Hebrew is our own uh, spinal column. The spinal column with the head, this Magdal. So Mary Magdalene is all of that for our physicality. That we prostitute. Hmm? That's why I said that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. And I said, no, is a prostitute. Still. We have to change it. 
to make it virgin, holy, by working our physicality. That's the first step. And the Lord help us. And the Lord is the solar light that we are doing, you know, the runes, all that forces that we are invoking in order for, for him to help to take those seven sins out of Mary Magdalene, which is us. And the Lord is, of course, the positive force. We are the negative. This is how you see it. And in the word Miriam is hidden precisely. Because the letter Mem means water in Kabbalah. The letter Resh, which is the R, means head. The letter Yod or Yad is a positive force or the energy in the water. And the letter Mem, again, is water. So you see, if we compare and we said our physicality is Miriam, Mary, Miriam, it means that we have to tap of waters, right? Above and below. And this is precisely the whole thing. Moses says, let us separate the waters from the waters, the superior from the inferiors. And then people are imagining there in the space something. Yeah, yes, also that. But if you apply it to yourself, and then you said the two waters. Where are those two waters in my body? Because I am Miriam. Right? And then you have to learn how to separate those waters. What waters? The sexual waters. Master Samael explained that we had two types of sexual waters. Or, my, or better said, the sexual creative waters polarize into positive and negative. Or masculine and feminine. What is the masculine? The cerebral spinal fluid. You know that the brain and the spinal medulla float in that fluid. That is called positive aspect of the creative force, sexual energy. And the other fluid is the sexual fluid that we have in our sexual glands. In Gnosticism, we call it semen whether masculine or feminine. The ovum floats in that feminine semen, and the sperm floats in that masculine semen, which is water, and is symbolized by mem. That's why when uh, the first, the head is the resh. You see in Hebrew it said head, resh, resh, head. And it's also the letter resh. The rush, the head. So when you write Miriam, you write it like this. M, R, I, M. This is in Hebrew. Miriam. Mem, Reish, Yot, Mem. And then you said, the water of the head and the water of the sexual energy. And the Yot, the sexual force of the father. That is what you are, Miriam. So save the forces of Miriam. Because humanity doesn't care. It's how you call uh, spilling the forces of Miriam. Utilizing those forces in the wrong way. And if we want to be born again, well, we need to be born from the womb of Miriam. Because only Miriam can give the birth to the Son of God inside of us, which is Christ, which is an energy, which is a force. It's not a person. It's too complicated this, or is it easy to understand? In the, in the Christian terms, it's easy to comprehend that, right? Now let us, uh, in order to, you can ask a question after this other explanation. 
that uh, I told you what came into my brain like this, this Geburah. You hear that uh, this root race is controlled by the fifth angel, right? Which is Samael. And Samael governs Geburah. Geburah and Samael are one. If you read the Sohar, you will see. We always address Geburah and Samael. When they always address Samael, or it's Geburah, right? Why? Because he is the responsible of this root race. We are finishing this root race, so he, that's why this doctrine that you're receiving is, is from Geburah. And anyone that wants to enter into the past have to receive it from Geburah. And uh, for instance, when you read uh, Christianity, you find that the angel Geburael is how you say it. You see, we pronounce it. Uh, for instance, in the invocation of Solomon, it says Geburael, which is Gabriel. Same thing, because if you want to write that uh, with Hebrew letter, you write Geburael or Gabriel. And who is the one that goes and said to Mary, you are going to have the Son of God? It's Gabriel. Because he's the one that has to do it. If you, re, uh, if you are Muslim, you will know that Gabriel is the one that teaches Muhammad. And he takes the Quran. Because Christ is working through Gabriel. So that's Sephira. It's not easy to see it uh, in Islamic uh, terms and also in the Old Testament because Gabriel is one of the angels that is close to God. Right? But of course, his sacred name is Samael. The same. But if we, when you said Geburael, for instance, you said in the invocation of Solomon, you named this part, you said, O Gedulael. Gedula is love or greatness. Gedulael and Geburael. Samael and Zahariel, in other words. Those are the names, you know. It's like, for instance, uh, uh, you name me, you say American, because we came from America, right? But my name is not American. So this is it. Any angel from that Gebura is a god from justice. And the head of that, his name is Samael. But uh, the whole story of this root race is very complicated. And if you don't know how to read it, you don't understand who is Christus Lucifer. Right? The one that was beautiful up here and descended and became Satan. Very ugly. But in each one of us, what we have to do now is to whiten the Satan and to return it to his own source and to make of him again Lucifer, bright star. Do you have questions? More questions? Lucifer means light bearer, yeah. Uh, uh, Luci or lux is Latin for light. And fair is carrier or bearer. But also can be translated as uh, uh, force, light and force. Because uh, fair or force is also fire. And it's in relation with the sexual force. So when you talk about Lucifer, you're talking about the carrier of the light, which is the fire. Right? As we were explaining yesterday, when we were making that bonfire, that uh, fire was given light. And that's precisely Lucifer. Meaning, the light, the fire from above, into the matter. 
when we put in the pieces of wood there, we were freeing Lucifer from its prison. And then we were using Lucifer in order to clean ourselves in different ways, right? This is the way that we do it in this type of ritual. But there are other ways in which we liberate Lucifer in order to take advantage of him. I mean, we liberate the light from the fire. What fire? The sexual fire. And that is Lucifer. That's one of the aspects of the meaning of it. Of course, as I said, the Catholic Church made of Lucifer something evil. The truth is this, that that Lucifer inside of us is no longer bright, it's dark because of an ego. So it's not Lucifer, it's Satan. But it's the same. In the matter is Satan. Free from the matter and, 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 and free from sin is Lucifer. So they are of Prometheus. Prometheus, exactly. There are many Satans in this planet as people. And how many Lucifers we find? Well, only those that liberated the light from the darkness. Uh, Jesus is Lucifer. Moses is Lucifer. Samael is Lucifer. Buddha is Lucifer. Completely enlightened. When you liberate Lucifer from his prison, from the ego, they give you wisdom. And in Greek, of course, they call it Christ. But somehow the Latin translation of that is everybody, when they name Lucifer, they immediately think something evil. So we have to learn. Yeah, uh, Satan is the negative polarization of Lucifer yeah. in us. It's not like the, the, the ordinary people think that uh, uh, Satan is someone there controlling the minds of everybody as an individual spirit. No. Lucifer is, I mean, Satan is multiple. You have your own Satan. I have my own Satan. And I have to whiten my own Satan. We, who is the same Lucifer, but black, because I, uh, he fell on me. And because of the way that I behave is, is why it's black. That's why we enter into this path in order to help Prometheus. If you want to understand Lucifer, read the, in, in Greek Roman mythology, the story of Prometheus. There's a more explanation. He steals the fire from heaven in order to give it to the man. Same meaning. Friends, to the rock, and the rock is this. It's called the rock of the Assad. This is the sexual force, which is the rock of offense and stone of stumbling. The rock, or the, it says in the Bible that the builders rejected is the sexual rock. And some of them said, the rock is Christ. Yes, the sexual Christic force in a genitalia, that's the rock. Yeah, the wisdom. The wisdom, the wisdom of Peter is the wisdom of sexual transmutation. Peter, when we study Peter the, uh, among the 12 apostles, Peter relates to the pineal gland. This is the here. This is the first apostle, Peter. When you transmute and you develop willpower, it's here, Peter, the one that is taking that from here. He has the keys. Well, you have to go on the website because there are many lectures about it. The lecture of Perth, for instance, right? The Rune Perth talks about that. There are many, many, many lectures about Peter. So, Peter is the first uh, Pope of Rome, right? 
and Rome backwards, says the master, is amore, which means love. The church of love. Huh? Everything was hidden in order not to uh, prostitute the doctrine. If in this day and age we are giving it so openly and explain every single mystery, it's because we have no time. This humanity is disappearing, and, and all those that want to be saved by their own work, there's the wisdom we are given to it. Before, uh, in ancient times, in order to receive this type of doctrine, first, you had to endure seven years in the monasteries. And to prove that you really love the Lord by being a monk, celibate, or a nun. And meditation and different practices that they were teaching in the monasteries. After seven years, you were tested. If you gain it, then they were telling me, okay, now you have to be in your celibacy, but connected with the nun that is going to marry you. Don't lose it. You keep it the seven years, do the same thing, and an other step on the step of chastity. But here, you know, you come and uh, stumbling on the rock. But uh, God is merciful. And we are receiving this doctrine so easily. So easily that uh, nobody appreciates it. There are only few. that um, Samael was the one giving the message. That is to say that uh, when we read Gabriel that, that it's invoking the archetype uh, called on by Samael and Gabriel, the two of them together. Yeah. Both those archetypes. It's the same because the head of that uh, uh, Sephira is Samael. Okay. Of course. Gabriel was also other archetypes. Yeah. Gabriel, yeah, Gabriel is associated with Jesod, right? But when you study astrology, you know that Samael is in relation with Arius, mm -hmm. which is in the head, and also with the Scorpio, which is in the sex, yeah. right? And this, when you study Samael as a scorpion, it is Gabriel, because the one, the moon reflects, as we were explaining a little bit before, the moon reflects the solar force, right? And that's the sod, meaning our sexual energy reflects the force of God in us. And that's Gabriel. But Gabriel is a male that gives the strength, the willpower, virility, right? Whether in the male or female. That's why it says that the angel came in, in to, into Mary. Right? When you read that, you, see, you, you imagine that an angel is in front of, of her and telling, you are going to be pregnant. God told me, right? But when you need, know Kabbalah, it says, who is above Gebura? It's Bina, the Holy Spirit. The white dove. And Gebura is coming down to your body, which is Miriam, Mary. You are going to be pregnant because you are just in chastity. And you really deserve this. So the Holy Spirit will descend through me, which is Geburah, and you will be pregnant. This is the force coming into your body. You see? This is how you have to see it. And that is, yeah. Yeah, of course. Like that. And that is what is called the Immaculate Conception. Right? Immaculate inside of you because you are chaste. Whether, of course, if we apply that to a feminine body, is better. 
because uh, uh, the woman here, this is feminine, and the woman is, and that's why uh, the, the master that took the archetype to represent that drama in the physical world was uh, the, the Virgin Mary that we know, that the mother of Jesus of Nazareth. She represents that force and all that drama. But Jesus, of course, represents the whole force coming from above through the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus, the Savior, which is Christ, can come down only through the Holy Spirit and be nigh the Holy Spirit. And that for us in, in Kabbalah is Chokmah. Comes like this. Enter here, down. And that is called the initiation. And if you read the Gospels in that way, you will understand it easily. That the whole work that and all the miracles that uh, are performed in the Gospels by Jesus Christ is something that happened within you. On the archetypes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, this is a good point. Yeah. We will say that each one of us has his own particular individual, Gabriel. Each one of us has his own particular, Miriam. Each one of us has his own individual, particular, Jesus of Nazareth. And also his own individual, particular, Samael. Hmm? We met, of course, the master in Mexico. But uh, it will be a blessed if that archetype comes into us active. Hmm? And that's the point. To understand that is very important. Because people mistook Jesus of Nazareth, the master of Veramento that came 2,000 years ago, individually, thinking that he is the one that saves and forgot about their own particular individual Jesus Christ that each one of us has to put in activity. He is the one that saves us. That archetype. But uh, we had to do a lot of work in order for that archetype to develop in us. And that is what is called Jesus Christ, because Jesus is Yeshua, which means Savior. And Christ is fire. There's something inside. Now, in which way he does it? Well, read the Gospels, because the Master of Veramento came to show that. As the Buddha came in order to show the, the way in which our own particular Buddha could be enlightened. Right? Buddha Sa Gautama Sakyamuni came in order to teach that. But uh, if you study Buddhism, you know that uh, all of us have that particle of Buddha inside of us. The Buddha Datu. Yeah. Oh, it, exactly. Every single sephira acts according to our own particular sign, too. I don't want to go, uh, I can be the whole week talking about this, but uh, <laughs> I'm just touching a little bit, you know, because this is very deep. This is just the surface, right? But what, what we want you to understand is this, that... All that is us, right? And we have to, to understand and to comprehend that in the very bottom. Because if we don't understand that in the very bottom, how are we going to, when we go and study the higher levels, we are not doing anything with Malkut. If we start working with Malkut, with the energies, 
because all of this, which you see above Malkut, all of that is inside as energy, as archetypes. And when we do runes and this and that, we put in ourselves physically, psychologically, spiritually, in contact with all of that. And that's why the study of the Tree of Life, uh, uh, the Ten Sephiroth, is, is wonderful. For us to understand the past. Because otherwise we fall into the mistake that many people are now, unfortunately, thinking that uh, the Lord will come on the clouds and uh, take the selected ones, you know. And everybody is claiming that uh, we are the group that uh, the Lord will save. And they say, no, we are the ones, right? And only talking about Christianity, but in different religions, you find different sects. And they have different ideas. Because they read literally. No, this is another sad thing. Uh, those that uh, study Nazism is, is still thinking the same way too. They do not don't get it, you know. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I understand that you have to feel the call from inside, the call of your inner being for doing this, you know. It's not that something that uh, if I go, for instance, imagine like Jehovah Witness talking the door and says, let me explain the tree of life for you. <laughs> they were like, what's going on here, right? No, look, Keter Chokmah Abinah, they really, they, no, right, <laughs> right? And all of that, of course, if they don't have that interest in order to study well, I'm sorry, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For us, it's very difficult. You know how many lectures are in the website? Hundreds. And it's still the people do not understand. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. <laughs> right, so. And this is good to, to, you have to mention that because uh, in Gnosticism, in, in the present group of Nazis, there's a lot of groups of Nazis, different. And they think that uh, in order to do the work, we have to belong to those groups, you see. And when we started this, we said, no. You have to work by yourself. You have to study the doctrine. But uh, we, we don't want to change you to us. And I said, oh, you belong to us. Some uh, student of us, for instance, that were uh, studying in, in New York, went to uh, Seattle, Washington, and he visited us a few mm, months or weeks ago. And then he approaches and says, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm worried. He says, why? Because I am this other group, and you might think that I left you. He said, yeah, you left us. You are in Seattle. We are in New York. <laughs> and how are we going to take care of you if you are so far away? You know what I mean? It's good that you go to that group. You don't belong to us. You belong to yourself. Or belong to your God, you know. But why we have to claim you as ours? Imagine, for instance, each one of you, the different uh, countries of Europe, right? And we said, if you go to other places, you are re ejected out of our organization. And then, then we go to New York. And <laughs> it says, damn, right? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> right? So the work is inside, you know? But now, fortunately, there are many groups like that. Very fanatic, very fanatic. And what can we do? You know, one day maybe they will understand, or maybe not.
Well, there are different types of, that's precisely a good uh, question. There's a different type of fanaticism. It depends what you're talking about, you know? Other groups, uh, uh, Gnostic groups, uh, I heard that they say that uh, you can practice the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness very seriously and do your meditation and help humanity in a lot of ways. But if you don't belong to the group, you are just wasting your time. And so, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is really... From where they get that type of uh, thought, I don't know. You know, this is ridiculous, right? But we have to know, uh, 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 what we have to do is to study the doctrine here very well in order to do the work and to be faithful to the avatar of Aquarius, which is Samael, the Buddha El, the head of many. No, it's not here in this. Uh, it's not in the flight. <laughs> it's inside, of course, right? It's, uh, all the forces are inside of us. No, it is not. Exactly. It's not uh, in, the, in, in this particular group or that group, right? That, uh, it's like, for instance, uh, uh, Masi Samael on Beor in Mexico talk about the extraterrestrials. That in a given moment, they, they will come and make contact with you and help in the exodus. Right? Which is true. In a given moment, they can come, come physically and help you. But if you are not doing anything, why are they going to help you? According to my own experience, they contact you internally and help you internally. And if I am saying that, it's because they are doing that with me. They are helping me because I am doing my work. But if I stop doing it and say, well, he doesn't want to work anymore, why are we going to keep helping him? The same way, you want to be helped, you have to work seriously. Even if they don't come physically. Because if you are not prepared, you have to be prepared also in order to receive a physical contact. But the best is the internal contact. Because then they start uh, guiding you and helping you in your psychological work. No matter where you are. And then you start understanding and comprehending that it's not to save your carcass. You see? It's your soul, the one that we're dealing here. Because sooner or later, as we said, we are going to die. Or is somebody here that uh, won't die? Yeah, but, but we are not in that times. We have to face that. <laughs> we are not in that times, and uh, why do you want to mummify your body anyhow? <laughs> it will, uh, you know why the mummification happened uh, at the time of Egypt? Because at that time there were many great initiates, fully developed. And when they were dying physically, they were mummifying their bodies with one purpose. And it's precisely for these times. So those initiates will come and liberate those uh, uh, mummies. And uh, uh, the, the way that they will help is that, uh, the, that those atoms or those physical bodies at that time were in contact with forces, secret natural forces that are free in order for us to receive the benefit. That's why I said, if they come and mummify our bodies, what benefit humanity will receive in the future? Terrible benefit. Because <laughs> the type of bodies that we have, sick and psychologically interrelated with us, is bad. I personally don't want to mummify my body. I want to burn it. But I cannot. But uh, the one that will be in charge of my funeral, I hope he will burn it. Completely. In hopes that I will receive a better body. Hmm? 
Hmm? Well, that's, you see, that's the point here. It's God the one that decides. You, you, it's your, every one of us has his inner God inside, your real being. And he's the one that takes over the, the work. We are just doing here what he commands. Exactly, but if he completes the work is the point. I'm doing the job down here, but uh, I don't know what is his uh, his plans are. You know what I mean? I don't know if he's in this life. Good. The only one that completed the work in this life that I know is Samael on Veor. And the rest, unfortunately, much as Samael said. From Venezuela and Colombia will come only a harvest of Hannah's musen, meaning people with double polarity. Masters inside, but with the ego very fat. And those had to return, to come back again and to keep doing the work, if they deserve it. And we are in all of those. You see, we are. Because we have ego. And we are doing our best, coming here and teaching everywhere in order to pay what we owe. And we enjoy doing it. But uh, the annihilation of the ego is his business, not mine. Why? Because he is the only one who can get destroyed. My duty is to comprehend my egos. And then the Divine Mother will destroy them, if I deserve it. Because it's always karma in, in between, you know. It's not easy to disintegrate an ego, especially if it's ego of lust. Other egos are easily, the ones that are minor, I mean, not that strong. But in order to disintegrate egos of lust, you have to work very hard, very hard, very hard, and finally, because they are associated with uh, adultery and all that, that uh, we have to pay. Read the Pieces of Fear, you will understand. Comprehension is the main thing here, but annihilation depends on God, always. Well, just to change your behavior is good. It's a good step. It's a, it's a good step to, to change your behavior, of course. To stop fornicating, com committing adultery, that's a good step. But uh, uh, the second step is to comprehend that, to meditate, because the egos are still inside. It's like those alcoholicals, alco alcoholic anonymous, right? That they stop drinking for many years, and all of a sudden they get drunk again. Why? Because the egos are still alive. So to stop uh, doing fornication and adultery is a good step, but not enough. You have to meditate, comprehend that. And if you annihilate those egos, if your divine mother destroys them, then you are doing a good job. Because the, if the, the delinquent is disintegrated, it won't be delinquency, right? But we have a lot of delinquents inside. They like to commit uh, delinquency. Name it, you, uh, different defects, right? When you don't feel any desire of what you were accustomed to do, yeah, not even, not even in your heart, in your mind, nothing. You just, you see, in, in case you are a man, you see a naked woman, and you are seen as a baby seeing his mother, right? If you reach that level, you are blessed. But that is a very long path. And if you still feel that, you say, oh, I'm behaving now, 
I'm not committing adultery, I'm doing my transmutation, etc. But every time that this person or this little uh, beautiful woman passes through me, I feel attracted. I desire, but I don't do anything. Well, meditate in that desire because you shouldn't feel anything. But not to feel that is not easy. Master Jesus of Nazareth says, it is enough to lust for a woman in order to commit adultery in your heart. To think about it. So, Well, who is the thinker? If that thought is in your head, you see, if, if that thought is in your head, It's not your own mind. You don't have willpower. You don't control it. But it's your mind. As you said, right? My mind is not my mind. Yeah, it's your mind because it's your mind. Right? It's your mind, but you don't control it. That mind controls you. And that's precisely the problem. If you have thoughts, for instance, of killing somebody, but who is thinking that? It's you. Because you only are the only one that knows that you are thinking. The barrier in the way that, I mean, the, to control that type of thought. You know, you are. We need to act with consciousness. Being out of that uh, group, right? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> that's another thing. But that's why you had to know how to react, you know? If you are pract a practical individual, gnostically speaking, you will know how to react in a certain situation. Like, let us put the example of, uh, of this great Gnostic, uh, call it Saint uh, Francis of Assisi. Uh, he was going to be killed in, in those places, uh, Arabia, you know, with the Muslims because he was preaching against Christianity and with this uh, Arab, uh, how you call this, sheikh? Yeah, told him, we're going to kill you because what you're doing here is against our religion, blah, 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 right? And then San Francisco of Assisi was so happy. <laughs> oh, he says, please, do it, because he wanted to die. <laughs> he wanted to die in this, right? And then he was surprised. It's, like, it's the first individual that is happy because I'm going to kill him. <laughs> you see, the, the level of being, very individual, you know. He's not afraid of death. But uh, we will react in different ways, too, you know. Probably cry there. <laughs> Please. So when you are a certain level, like, in, let's put down an example of Master Jesus, crucified there. And everybody was mocking him, and he was going to die, you know. And he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. The type of comprehension and understanding is very high. To reach that level is precisely a great goal. And we are in the very bottom. We will say, if we compare our work with a building, are we in the first floor? We will say, no, we are in the basement. Right? In the basement. It depends how many levels have that basement. Too. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, the intellect is the first level that we have to comprehend the ego. And after that, we have to apply meditation and then to go deeper and deeper into the other levels and into initiation as well. Because Master Samael explains that. He says, we have seven levels. Or oh, the true man has a seven, uh, uh, in his constitution, seven levels. But when we are not uh, twice born, when, we, when the archetypes are just there in potentiality, but not in activity, those levels of the true man, which are seven, are very subjective, shallow levels. And if you multiply those seven levels by seven, and then you find the 49 levels of... Uh, of the mind, which is uh, what we were explaining in the last lecture about uh, vanity of vanities, said the preacher, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Uh, in those short words, I said the tree of life, or the seven levels of the human being, right? We're talking about symbols. The Zohar says, vanity of vanities, said the preacher. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. How many vanities did I say? Seven. Because vanities is two, plural. And vanity is one. Vanity and vanities, said the preacher. Vanity and vanities, six. Everything is vanity, seven. You see that, the Kabbalah there? So easy to see, but if you don't know, you think that you are talking about uh, uh, vain people that like to go to the store and buy beautiful clothes and makeup and all that.
No. It's not coincidence. Really, when you study the word, the tree of, Le, of Levi is in the left side of the tree of life. And that's evil. The right is good and the left is evil. The right is Adam and the left is Eve. You see? And this is why many women said all women are evil. In reality, uh, the woman is a relation with evil. But what woman? This is a woman. This is Eve. Kabbalistically speaking. It's a physicality. That's Eve. Was taken from the tree of life from above and make the physicality. That's Eve. In the moment, yeah. In the moment, or the moment of the, the thought. Comprehension. But also, if it's something that is so like serious, and you're on the brink of doing something really stupid, you need to remove yourself from that situation too. You know what I mean? Like, if you are really right on the brink of doing something, photograph or prayer or whatever, you need to physically get yourself out of that situation first, and then do the rest. Because you can be very close to very stupid acts. Yeah. Exactly.
the mummies? In relation of what? Mem. Oh, mem. Yes. Yeah, you see the letter mem there. Of course. The Let, letter mem is always ready to matter. You see? Yeah, and the water is the mummies. And the puppy is the fire. <laughs> it was said mommy, you see the same word for mommy, right? Mommy is the water, is, is the matter. <laughs> it's true. The Any type of matter is the mother. Even in Kabbalah, you all understand that the matter, whether it is very heavy or very light, is the mother. And is the mem. Right? This is what it is in the space. It's called the akash. That's the mem. But our physicality is the lower mem. And that's precisely what those masters in ancient times that were reaching the civilization, higher levels, obviously their matter were reflecting that. And they were mummified for this time. And all that were preserved for the golden age of the future wood race. Those uh, uh, mummies uh, will uh, be active again in the future wood race. And uh, the, the masters will get that information because it's in the atoms of the mummies. Well, if you are prepared in certain levels, you can get that information. But you have to reach the, the level. Otherwise, we'll be preserved for the, for the next root race. And what the Master says, how is, uh, the great civilization of this root race will emerge again in the next root race? And will emerge in higher octave. And that's why we have uh, certain elements, like the mummies are, that will be active at that time, and then in another higher octave, they will elevate that uh, force, you know. In the golden age. Mm -hmm. In the golden age, everything is pure. In the silver age, too. But the copper age will be a decline. Well, not at this level, but uh, it will happen again, the degeneration again. But not, that, not so low like we are right now. And, and that time will be the last opportunity for those that cannot do it in this time. But will be worse, I guess. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be sad. <laughs> Having this beautiful opportunity, you know, the the doctrine, the way that we are giving us so openly, and not take advantage of it. Oh my God. Maybe you will be said, oh, I want to return. You have to pass seven years of ordeals, and we will see if you are worthy. Yeah. They get it. Those that were looking for the knowledge, they get it. Or they got it, in other words. So. The, 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 how do you call the requisite in order to get the knowledge as we receive it now, or the requirements? No, the first requisite is to be awakened. All of the great alchemists of the Middle Ages, they were awakened. They knew how to travel in the astral plane. And in order to get that, they were working very hard. And usually the knowledge was received in the internal planes, not in the physical world. That's the karma. But now we have Dharma. Good karma here. 
because uh, now in this day and age, in order to somebody, for instance, is very interested in these types of knowledge, but never hear about gnosis. He goes into the internet and the website, and he finds Gnostic teachings are all. There. <laughs> right? In the Middle Ages, no. There were no internet. So we are lucky, really. Indeed. How many of you found it like that during the internet search? I mean, you mean a, a being that is not your being? Yes, exactly. That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. No, what, what, what happens is this. You have your own being. And every single atom of your physicality is controlled by a minute monad that belongs to your being. It's mine. It's, it's yours. But no, no, it's yours. It's, everything is yours. It's all belongs to your monad. In order for your monad to create that body that you have, the monad sent many particles of its own electricity or energy in order to active every single atom of every system of your organism. And that's your monad. There's no other monad there. It's yours. Another thing is this. When you eat any type of food, of course, then you are eating the atoms of that particular monad that is assisting, helping you, is being sacrificed for you. But that transforms. But your monad is the one that controls all of that. The digestive system, your circulatory system. And thanks to the other monads that are given the bodies for you to be alive. That's the, that's the way to understand. But that your atom will be controlled by a certain monad who knows where now? Is your only your monad is the one that control your? You mentioned that it will be really very difficult to self-realize yourself. You know, <laughs> if you ask, what is the monad of this atom that I want to control? Who knows? Maybe in vacations, or <laughs> it will be difficult, right? What is true also, also that you have within, or we have within, these psychological aggregates that instead of controlling your monad, instead of controlling your atoms, they are the ones that are doing it. For instance, when you go and drink, it's not your monad that is telling you drink this and get drunk. It's your ego alcohol, right? And that's precisely the one that you have to disintegrate, which is an intruder, right? And, and that way is different, but it's not a monad. It's just a, a demon inside of us. Monads don't do that. Demons do it. Like those precisely individuals that says, oh, I am a medium and I'm here now is a Master Jesus of Nazareth talking through me. No. Master Jesus of Nazareth has his own body. It doesn't need to enter into anybody to speak. Right? And unless it's a demon. A demon will do it. Will possess you. And this is what we are. We are possessed by different aggregates, psychological defects, vices, etc., that unfortunately are inside of us. Then we have to annihilate them. And that, that's why we are reunited here. 
to learn how to clean our own house. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, no, that's 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 here. That's that's a, and then we go here. Then we understand it. In this uh, second sephira, which is called Chokma Wisdom. All of us are one, but here, not not here, there. Now, if you meditate here with a good uh, position and concentrate and control your mind, and for adventure you leave your body with the consciousness, and then you manage to go here, and if you are concentrated in John the Baptist, because everybody is one there, and then you become John the Baptist. And if you concentrate in Jesus of Nazareth, you become Jesus of Nazareth. And if you concentrate in Buddha, you become Buddha. And it happened with me. I was concentrating, meditating in Krishna Murti, you know. And I went there, and I uh, felt myself being Krishna Murti. And I was, uh, I was talking about it. And then if I returned, Krishna Murti was still alive. I said, why? Uh, do we have two bodies now? No, no. There I experienced, but when I returned, I was myself again. Okay? And this is precisely when you are experiencing that, is there. But when you return, you are no longer there. You are in the physical plane, and you are wherever you are. Well, that could be another experience in another sephira. But related with self-realized masters, all of them are here in Chokmah. They are one. Only the masters, yeah. And, uh, of course, all of us are there. But, like, when we say, like, I don't know, maybe if I said it, I would say it. Like a mosquito. You know? We are a mosquito there. But you were self realized, then we would be a master. But right now we just there. Uh, right? so we, we, we are one. one but it's just uh, something that, you know, at, at to understand. Point, though, so it doesn't mean you don't have any personal responsibility for the fact that you are not in the same plane as them. Why, why have a personal responsibility for the past life if you actually are still like, Well, you don't remember. Don't, you don't remember. But the, uh, but the thing is that when we remember, then we realize that. The one that has different bodies is the soul. And we are the soul. It's like when you go to, uh, after we finish this uh, retreat, and you go to your home, and you have a new pair of pants, new shirt, it doesn't mean that you are not here, because you are now having a new pair of pants, and new shoes, and socks, and all that. You are the same person, but with a new suit, right? Same thing. What you did here, what you did with that suit. The same with the soul. I understand individuality, the ability of uh, understanding each part of our being and controlling it. And we had to build it. We never had it. Individuality is something that is very sacred that we have to build. Is what the Master Jesus says, we have to be born again. Or in other words, we have to be a real individual. Because we, right now we are a collective of individuals. Right? Yeah. 
do it, we don't know about the Holy Spirit. Because we're like that mark of our heart. Always sort of in a state of struggle and conflict. And that moment of conflict is the moment of the Holy Spirit. And the individual is the moment of the moment of the Holy Spirit. The first step in order to be an individual is to create the astral, solar body. That's the first step. And then you are individual after death. Otherwise, you just spread in many. That's sad, but it is the truth. And right now, we are individuals because we have the physical body. And we feel as individuals, but physically speaking. But if we lose the physicality, then that individuality, physical individuality, disappears. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,